David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, February twenty third, twenty twenty one. Hey, Ed, it's it's my wife's birthday, so celebratory day today. Uh, hey, funny story. <laughs> I found a birthday gift for her, and it was a thing I had bought for a Christmas present and hidden away. And then in December, I couldn't find it anywhere. I looked all over in my usual hiding spots. And I, I couldn't find it. And then I turned it up a, a little while ago. And, well, our birthday was coming up. So uh, a, a little laugh this morning. There was a nice, nice enough gift. But uh, it was extra fun because it was something we thought we had lost forever. I think I had just come to the conclusion that I might have, like, put it on the roof of the car after shopping and then drove off without putting it in the car or something. We thought it was lost forever. But it's there. So that's good news. There's good news, there's bad news, there's all kinds of news this morning. Uh, <clears throat> let's get on with it and get the show underway. Bill tweets us all the way from Portland, Maine, and uh, via Twitter, it's not that far. So what do we got here? The K-Grow in the Morning show is live now. True. k X, me, David Waldman, previews today's Capitol Hill action, including the Merrick Garland hearing, the Insurrection Committee hearing, and Josh Hawley getting his tongue stuck to the flagpole again. Yeah, you know, I heard about that one, but I didn't get a chance to uh, read what that was all about. And there was a popular <clears throat> front uh, or highly rated Daily Coast diary about that yesterday. I should probably just go and grab that because it was an uh, attractively titled piece. And perhaps we can dive into that. And it's Tuesday, so Joan McCarter should be around uh, in the late hours of the show. And we'll discuss what's going on. We got a pretty good, well, kind of a technical, weedy rundown of what was going on with COVID relief and the reconciliation bill and all the rules swirling around it yesterday. But maybe we can uh, recap all of that in a way that might be easier to digest and get some sense of when things might really be moving and when checks might get cut and when we could expect to see them, if you're expecting to see them at all. So we can cover that, cover what's going on with Merrick Carlin. Yeah, he's actually getting his hearings, so that's pretty good. Uh, let's see. I see uh, this morning, before I jump over to the uh, front uh, or the, uh, the, the diary, on Josh Hawley's experience yesterday. I see there's some more for today. Who's tweeting this one? Seth, uh, Scott, Scott McFarlane, not Seth McFarlane, the guy from what is he? He's like the uh, cartoonist, right? Family guy. Uh, Scott McFarlane, though, uh, totally different person and a, an NBC investigative reporter who says, uh, well, he's investigated this and he's found this. Today, Senator Josh Hawley will question the former U.S. Capitol Police Chief and former Sergeants at Arms about failures to prevent the insurrection of January 6th. He's on the Senate Homeland Security Committee for today's hearing. That should be interesting. And uh, <clears throat> I see in one of the responses, he's tied up in another one of the stories that I've put together. It's a, it's a bad couple of days, I think, although probably Josh Hawley thinks it's a great couple of days for him. Let me uh, grab this diary, as I mentioned here, written by uh, Aldous Penny Farthing. You know that uh, name. We've gone to it a couple of times, and he's a popular diarist and uh, finds his things on the recommended list all the time, and with good reason. Merrick Garland just left Josh Hawley in a smoldering heap, it says. This is from a report yesterday, uh, posted at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern, and uh well, I'm always wary. I mean, it caught my eye, certainly, but I'm always wary of those sorts of headlines because uh, when I say, when I see somebody say, you know, oh, hey, watch so-and-so get totally destroyed by XYZ person in this one, and then I watch it, and I'm like, eh, you know, it wasn't even all that rough, really. I don't know. I usually get disappointed by this. So let's see about this smoldering heap business because it keeps coming up. <clears throat> so it seems like... Uh, Seems like a lot of people feel that way about what happened yesterday, and I still don't 
know exactly what transpired. Let's find out together, unless you already know, in which case you can point at me and laugh that I didn't know this. But uh, it's been trying times. I can't keep up with everything. Anyway, I never thought to hear such snark from someone as genteel as Merrick Garland. And maybe he wasn't trolling the poster boy of domestic terror and, sur and insurrection after all. But damn, it sure feels like Garland whose path to the Supreme Court was derailed by a metric, well, we'll say F-ton, of Republican F-nuttery, there's an awful lot of the thanks, Eldis, <laughs> was directing some well-deserved artillery fire at Senator Josh Hawley this fine morning. There is embedded here in a few tweets making the same comment, Igor Bobich saying, uh, asked by Josh Hawley, oh, I guess we'll just get right to the, the heart of it, asked by Josh Hawley if he supports defunding the police, Merrick Garland said he does not, citing the horror experienced by police officers at the January 6th the Capitol, attack on the Capitol. Okay, well, now I get it. I see the, the point here. And then lots of people saying zing and uh, all sorts of dunking memes. And I guess that entertained everybody. Ah, that felt pretty good. So that's at the bottom of it. Yeah, that's a pretty good answer. You support defunding the police? No, I don't. As a matter of fact, look how bad the cops had it on... January 6th, when you fomented an insurrection that uh, injured and even killed <clears throat> several of the, well, killed one police officer and injured several, over 100, as it now turns out. Okay, so we've got that. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, one of the responses to Scott McFarland's tweet leads me back to pocket to pull out a piece I put aside yesterday without knowing whose records I would be uh, discovering were in FBI hands. Now the uh, now the suspense is uh, eliminated, I guess, here as uh, one of the responses to Scott McFarland's tweet about what Hawley is doing today is, hope he remembers that the FBI has his phone records. Ah, okay. Now I understand. Okay, so this story I grabbed yesterday, <clears throat> I got to put these uh, things in my in, back in pocket so that I have them for you for today's summary. Uh, I grabbed a story from The Intercept. Uh, FBI seized congressional cell phone records related to Capitol attack, and I guess we must now know that Josh Hawley's were among them, and it feels like a good grab. As far as I can tell, Ken Klippenstein and Eric Lichtblau are the co-byline to this piece. Uh, I didn't realize that Klippenstein was an intercept writer all this time. Was he always? Well, I don't know. I usually see his stuff go by on Twitter, <clears throat> and I, uh, I don't think I made that connection. Maybe it's always been there and I missed it because I don't pay attention to stuff. Or maybe it's new. FBI seized congressional cell phone records related to Capitol attack. Uh, the inclusion of congressional phone data. And this is a good point, And The Intercept would uh, be the place to pick up on this and put it as the subheadline, I think. The inclusion of congressional phone data in the FBI investigation raises thorny constitutional questions. I think they got uh, the real point out of that pretty quickly. But let's see. Within hours of the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, the FBI began securing thousands of phone and electronic records connected to people at the scene of the rioting, including some related to members of Congress, potentially raising thorny legal questions. We knew all about and knew very quickly that this was going to happen even before they announced it, that, yeah, all of the people storming the Capitol. I knew on the day of. We all mentioned it. We talked about it. Um, we talked about it the day after, I suppose, on the air. That everybody, you know, in all the pictures storming the Capitol, holding up their phones to take uh, photos and to stream video, etc. It was pretty obvious quite, you know, immediately that all these people are doing this thing that, that ordinarily, I, I hope, will result in their uh, being charged with any number of things, at the minimum trespassing, right, or uh, unlawful entry into a government building. And they're all holding handheld tracking devices that are going to tell every computer around them and every cell phone tower exactly where they were. But, you know, they weren't a smart group of people. So 
Okay. Anyway, moving on and I guess exploring the th potentially thorny legal questions using special emergency powers and other measures. And I don't even think they really needed that. The FBI has collected reams of private cell phone data and communications that go beyond the videos that rioters shared widely on social media, according to two sources with knowledge of the collection effort. Lots of it, all this information really <clears throat> would likely be available from, uh, well, I guess we could say quasi public sources, uh, you know, private entities that will have it and could provide it to law enforcement without uh, Fourth Amendment implications. But on the other hand, we also knew that they were likely to have things like what they call the Stingray equipment, the cell phone, um, uh, the towers that uh, essentially disguise themselves as cell phone towers and uh, relay and intercept and log cell phone contacts, often found near important government installations and places that require additional security. And, uh, I guess that would qualify under the special powers, certainly, and that's sort of a, uh, a standing uh, global war on terror type expansion of police powers uh, that uh, people rightly question and protest left and right. But, uh, well, here it is again. Uh, in the hours and days after the Capitol riot, the FBI relied on, in some cases, on emergency orders that do not require court authorization in order to quickly secure actual communications, that's even different from what I'm talking about, from people who were identified at the crime scene. Investigators have also relied on data dumps from cell phone towers in the area to provide a map of who was there, allowing them to trace call records but not content from those phones. The cell phone data includes many records from the members of Congress and staff members who were at the Capitol that day to certify President Joe Biden's election victory. The FBI is searching cell towers and phones, pinging off cell sites in the area to determine visitors to the Capitol. A recently retired senior FBI official told The Intercept, the data is also being used to map links between subjects, which include members of Congress, they also said. Interesting enough to refer to them as, oh, as, as suspects. Uh, did I say subjects? But I meant suspects. I was going to say, uh, that's some gentle language, but maybe because they're discussing members of Congress, they use that broader term, subjects. But no, it's suspects. Hmm. Well, good. I suspect some of the members of Congress in this as well. I think we all do. Certainly, uh, we know the names we've been discussing in the past, and Hawley's been on that list for quite some time. Uh, then a parenthetical remark here in the Intercept piece. Capitol Police are reportedly investigating whether lawmakers helped rioters gain access to the Capitol, as several Democrats have alleged they did, though Republican officials deny this, uh, as uh, they ordinarily would. Okay, the Justice Department has publicly said that its task force includes senior public corruption officials, that involvement indicates a focus on public officials, i.e. Capitol Police, I guess they actually include them in public officials, and members of Congress, the retired FBI official said. I don't know that I would have included uh, Capitol Police under public officials uh, myself in the first instance. But now that they say so, I suppose I can see the argument for it. In recent years, the FBI has had to tread lightly in seeking any records of members of Congress due to protections under the Constitution's speech or debate clause, which shields the legislative work of Congress from ex uh, executive branch interference. The legal minefield grew out of a 2007 corruption case against former Representative William Jefferson, a Democrat, of course, of Louisiana, when an appeals court ruled that the FBI had improperly seized material from his congressional office. Uh, I'm sure there were plenty of Republicans cheering that on at the time and thinking, well, it'll never be used against me or anyone I like, so fine, go for it. What have I got to hide? Nothing. Well, your day has finally come. On January 11th, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse uh, released a statement warning against the Justice Department getting involved in the investigation of the attack at least regarding members of Congress, asserting that the Senate should oversee the matter. Asked to elaborate, White House, a former federal prosecutor, told The Intercept 
Separation of powers principles generally, and the speech and debate clause particularly, restrict the executive branch's ability to investigate members of Congress. That's why the Constitution puts the houses of Congress in charge of disciplining their own members. In the case of the January 6th insurrection, I've asked the Senate Ethics Panel to take a hard look at certain members' behavior, including whether they coordinated or conspired with, aided and abetted, or gave aid and comfort. Ooh, strong language there. Aid and comfort, of course, comes from the construction of the treason statutes and the treason uh, mentions in the, uh, the Constitution itself. Aid and comfort to the insurrectionists. Those questions demand answers, and the Senate Ethics Committee has the job to answer them. I don't know if it's really up to the task, though, to be quite honest. Uh, it is not clear whether the collection of cell phone records from members of Congress on the day of the riots might conflict with that protection because there is far less legal protection for non-content data. That is an interesting and thorny question. I think it depends on the nature of the phone call. Were they calling other members to discuss legislative business or was it for another purpose? Said Daniel Schumann, who I'm sure a lot of you know from Twitter and his work elsewhere, policy director for Demand Progress, an advocacy group focused on internet freedom and progressive policy challenges. Congressional law expert Michael Stern said that while speech or debate privileges are generally narrowly construed when it comes to criminal investigations, such issues have often become subject to intense political conflict in the past. In the House, it's often become a partisan fight historically when someone's under investigation and the other party says you should disclose everything and the party that wants to protect it says, no, no, there's institutional concerns here. We can't let the FBI come in and run roughshod over everything, Stern said. Federal authorities have used the emergency orders in combination with signed court orders under the so-called pen trap exception, uh, pen being from the the pen register, old uh, surveillance device that uh, also didn't uh, capture phone call content, but captured the phone numbers making a call and the numbers to which they were calling and how long the connection was, etc. So the pen register and trap exception to the Stored Communications Act to try to determine who was present they're using all this information to try to determine who was present at the time that the Capitol was breached, the source said. In some cases, the Justice Department had used these and other hybrid court orders <laughs> to collect actual content from cell phones. That's a new one, like text messages ah, and other communications in building cases against the rioters, really working right up to it, abutting, but not crossing the line to spoken communication over the phone function. Okay. The collection effort has been met with little resistance from telecom providers. Well, they didn't provide any resistance the first time. They shouldn't provide it now. Asked to turn over voluminous data on the activity that day. No one wants to be on the wrong side of the insurrection, a source involved in the collection effort said. This is now the scene of the crime. Michael German, a former FBI agent, Trump likes his last name, uh, who is a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program, said that the January 6th attack on the Capitol certainly seems to fit the type of national emergency that would allow the FBI to legally expedite its collection of electronic data. I guess I'd have to agree. Whether it's a good idea or not is a different story, but I, I'd have to agree it falls under the, that category. But he said that the wide collection of such data from the event reflects a flawed approach that will inundate investigators with volumes of data that isn't necessarily helpful to distinguish who committed violence at the Capitol versus those who were engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience. Oh, I think you'll be able to tell. Basically, if you're inside, eh, violent or not, you're, you, you've got a trespassing charge coming. And, uh, yeah, they'll probably be able to sort that out and match it with other data, including uh, uh, hits on smaller range local networks, uh, you know, 
Bluetooth and Wi-Fi networks inside the building. There will be places where there was vandalism inside of an office uh, where you're not going to have your phone show up on the network of that, you know, on that Wi-Fi network uh, unless you were in it or real close. And uh, from there, some questioning. I mean, I, I guess it shouldn't necessarily be enough that your phone pings something to pin vandalism that happened there on you, but some questioning to follow might clear things up. And the phone data might uh, clear up who to start questioning. Anyway, we'll continue on here. Meanwhile, the vast majority of people whose cell phone data will be collected in this manner are completely innocent of engaging in any criminal activity, but will remain in the suspect pool that is created with any bulk collection program where the future consequences they might face are unknown. Uh, all right, well, that's an overly cautious approach to it, and uh, maybe a good one. In a letter sent two days after the riot to 11 major cell phone and Internet companies, including AT&T, mobile, you know who they are, but also including Facebook and, uh, and Apple, uh, Senator Mark Warner urged the companies to immediately preserve content and associated metadata connected to the riot. Some of the telecommunications providers questioned whether Warner has the authority to make such a request. You always have the authority to make a request. But a number of them appear to have been preserving data from the event anyway because of the large scale of violence, the source said. The FBI declined to comment on any of the specific investigative tools it is using in the January 6th investigation, except to say that the Bureau has received more than 200,000 tips to date from the public in response to its request for help in identifying rioters. As with all our operations, the FBI conducts itself according to our legal requirements and established policies, the Bureau said in a statement. The Justice Department also declined to comment, referring any questions on investigative methods to the FBI. So that is the close of the piece here. And, uh, well, yeah, uh, it doesn't uh, get too far into discussion of the of the constitutional issues, except to say that clearly the speech and debate clause uh, poses some possible barrier, at least to uh, uh, the extent to which the Justice Department or any other executive branch department combs through the data that's identifiable as belonging to the cell phone of a member of Congress. Although, make for some interesting arguments. I mean, the fact that the phone belongs to the member of Congress, and I guess, uh, well, you know, some of them, I guess if you could tell that it's a personal phone owned by the member of Congress, that might be one thing. If it's an official phone that is, you know, in that sense, I guess we'll say, uh, quote unquote, owned by the member of Congress. Here it would have been purchased on behalf of that member of Congress using official office funds for use for official business. Uh, you know, it might be very interesting to uh, see how they separate that out and whether they think they need to treat the personal phone of a member of Congress differently from an official phone. And then, of course, uh, a whole different ream of issues arises if there's reason to look into the data or content of any of the activity of, of an official phone, and it turns out that uh, the official phones were being used for, well, certainly the insurrection was unofficial business. But uh, yeah, lots of different issues arise depending on what you're looking for and which phone you're looking for it on and what the ownership status of that phone is. It could be real interesting. And uh, it'd be interesting to watch to see whether there were any members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, who were very enthusiastic about the broad ability of law enforcement to look into what Congressman Jefferson was doing, uh, but who now insist that this would be a terrible breach of constitutional separation of powers now that a Republican is targeted. And I got to tell you, it's a pretty good bet that you'll come up with somebody, though it has been an awful long time. Uh, since the Jefferson case. I mean, it's not 
that long. It's living memories, certainly. A lot of members of Congress who are still around who served with him and might have uh, ventured a comment or two on the House floor during debates. Uh, but uh, good activity for the researchers and investigative reporters out there. All right, coming up on the first break. I think that fit in there nicely. Uh, but we'll jump to a couple other stories, and there are plenty. This, it's uh, As I mentioned in the Morning Post, it's uh, it's a day and a week, really, for the development of more and more information. As each day passes, literally, there's more and more on the Capitol insurrection. One of the arguments that people had for either delaying or drawing out the proceedings on the uh, impeachment of Donald Trump. And of course, all of this will eventually, I think, tie back to the White House and we'll venture into a couple other stories that uh, examine that connection a little more closely. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just toss in this one as we get ready to exit for our break. Uh, happened to pick up the story this morning, uh, and I'm trying to look for who sent it to me, and it's in my Twitter feed, and I'll find it, but uh, pointed out one of our, our favorite uh, points on which we, uh, a point which we revisit fairly frequently on the show, uh, members of Congress steering money to themselves and into their own pockets by using, uh, hopefully not official funds, that'll get you in real trouble, but campaign funds to buy copies of their own book so that they can earn royalties, quote unquote, earn royalties on these things. Uh, yeah, here it is. Kurt Audible Video on Twitter, who sent this one to us. Uh, here's an old chestnut of yours, old favorite chestnut, GOP fundraising from book sales. Guess who? After this. Hi, it's me, David Goldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Did you guess? Did you already read it? I don't know. Uh, I'll tell you, no more suspense. It's a piece in Salon. It's Roger Sullenberger again. Now, oh, sorry, pop up. Now, Ted Cruz who everyone loves, Ted Cruz may be buying his own books through a mystery company. Ted Cruz, much in my Twitter feed this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, Cancun Ted, or Flyin' Ted, as some call him, uh, really <clears throat> landing himself in hot water with all of this, uh, which, you know, quite honestly, in Texas, they would be very happy to have the hot water. The problem is he's been dunking himself in it, and now now it's contaminated. That was the boil notice that most of Texas was under. Yes, we have hot water, but Ted Cruz has been in it. So don't forget to boil it again. It was already hot to start with, but now it's hot and full of Ted Cruz. Ugh. Anyway, uh, he was also in my Twitter feed this morning um, as, let's see, uh, Kara Kay uh, has uh, tweeted on here. Uh, let's see. There are, uh, well, uh, and I guess a, a KITM listener, too, because look, she used the hashtag and everything, uh, responding to a conversation going on this morning between Gabriel De Benedetti, De Benedetti uh, who is Gabriel De Benedetti? He's a checkmark kind of person and everything here, national correspondent for New York Magazine. I can't keep track of all the New York Magazine people by heart, you know. Uh, who says, uh, in response to Manu Raju's tweet regarding Ted Cruz this morning, Manu Raju, of course, CNN correspondent, uh, this morning, is it this morning? I'll double check. Yep, 
tweeting, Ted Cruz tells Josh Holmes, and Josh Holmes, I understand, is a uh, former Mitch McConnell staffer who now is <clears throat> in political journalism somehow. Uh, and you'll find out one of the delivery methods of his political journalism through this Twitter conversation. Ted Cruz tells Josh Holmes that his wife, Heidi, is, quote, pretty pissed at the leaked texts about the Cancun trip. I'm sure, but uh, practice better security. Anyway, here's a suggestion, I guess, Ted Cruz tells Josh Holmes. Just don't be a-holes, <laughs> which is some kind of suggestion to come from Ted Cruz. Um, and I guess he probably thinks everybody else uh, can can do that. It might just be that it's tough for him. I don't know. Maybe or maybe it's the opposite approach in, in his mind. Anyway, so here's a suggestion. Just don't be a-holes. He doesn't he doesn't clean his language up. Uh, yeah, like just, you know, treat each other as human beings have some degree, some modicum of respect. OK, so like just treat each other as human beings. I would have said there, comma. Have some degree, some modicum of respect. Well, <clears throat> lots of problems with that. Of course, first, Ted Cruz is saying it, and he is an a-hole, and he doesn't treat other people as human beings or have any degree or modicum of respect for others. But he was thought he was being lighthearted, and he uh, later makes a Zodiac killer quip, which really isn't you know necessarily a topic for a senator to joke about, but we give him a break on this one because we rib him as the Zodiac killer all the time saying, uh, look, I haven't gotten this much negative press coverage since Northern California in the 60s. But um, it's actually not a good quip at all. But that's what he was doing. So Manu Raju passes this on. Uh, but uh, there's an issue with that. Uh, Gabriel de Benedetti points out that he said this to Josh Holmes on Josh Holmes's podcast which I mean, this is a little bit complex, but I think you'll grab it. It's only a one line thing from Gabriel here. Are you, are you ready for this? So he said it on his podcast. What's the name of Josh Holmes's podcast? And the answer is it's called Ruthless, which, okay, you know, he's a former McConnell operative. And I think he's now uh, both the, in sort of political opinion journalism and uh, consulting and PR which actually is kind of a conflict of interest, but, you know, it's the sort that is permitted. I'm in political consulting and PR, and I need to do something for my client, and so I write or ghostwrite for my client a political opinion piece that says exactly what we our strategy has calculated needs to be said. All right, so Ruthless, he's a political operator, right? What What's the big deal? Well... The Ruthless podcast is interesting. Um, I haven't listened to it, but I am directed to their page and where you can find it. And, you know, all the podcasts we have sort of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, branded artwork that identifies our podcast. And, you know, there's an official looking government building in the picture and in the Ruthless type treatment that's in there. But it. You know, it's giant type, so it's broken up into two lines, ruthless, under, you know, stacked type. Um, and, you know, he's a government type guy, so maybe it's not such a big deal. But the government building that they chose happens to be the, the Supreme Court building. And the podcast happens to have launched, as Gabriel notes here, four days after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Ha ha ha. I'll call my podcast Ruthless because that's what the Supreme Court is now. Instead, it's going to have Amy Coney Barrett on it instead. So just don't be a-holes. Treat people with as human beings with some degree, some modicum of respect, says Ted Cruz, a-hole with no respect, to Josh Hawley, who has named his podcast as a way of trolling the immediately still fresh death of Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So, you know, F the two of them all the way to the bottom of the ocean and then nuke them just to be sure. 
just thought I would point that background out, and that, I guess, is why Kara feels just perfectly comfortable repeating the old saw about Ted Cruz that she says, yeah, I hear Greg Dworkin say this on KITM all the time. There are two kinds of people, those who hate Ted Cruz and Ted Cruz. And that's pretty much true, and he's solidifying the reputation every day. Wow. What a... What an a-hole talking to another a-hole. All right. Well, anyway, uh, it will therefore please you to know that Salon is busting Ted Cruz in a self-dealing operation, or at least they think so. Uh, We'll put it in question mark form, Fox News question mark, the Salon version of that. Now Ted Cruz may be buying his own books through a mystery company. If Cancun Ted is paying royalties to himself through a shadow entity, that could stir the FEC into action. Um, It's a little bit of an anticlimax, stirring the FEC into action, because that doesn't often happen. And uh, I want to stir, you know, law enforcement into action. But it starts there. One day before the Georgia Senate runoff elections, and two days before the Capitol insurrection, a leadership PAC... We talk about those all the time. Attached to Senator Ted Cruz paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to a mystery company that had previously bought copies of Cruz's book, according to recent filings with the FEC. Of course, the Federal Election Commission. The expenses raise questions about whether the controversial conservative senator and a-hole and, as they note here, Cancun frequent flyer, used those political campaigns and Donald Trump's attempt to subvert the democratic process to raise money for himself. That could push the FEC to issue a ruling on a pending issue that could have consequences for former President Donald Trump's fundraising as well. And uh, the issue here, again, isn't that uh, Ted Cruz is raising money off of the insurrection in the form of like sending out uh, fundraising appeals saying, help us fight the, even even the big lie, help us fight the election steal, or, or help us uh, fight the unjust impeachment of Donald Trump, or help me, uh, you know, fight against unjust charges that I had anything to do with this whatsoever while I go to Cancun. That's all. It's It's rotten, but it's legal, even if it's not entirely clean and upstanding. Uh, Not something you're going to find yourself in the wrong side of the law for, but rather, as they said here, um, was he raising money for himself by way of converting campaign funds and PAC funds into personal funds by purchasing the books with that money and then earning the royalties off of the sales, which are really fake sales at this point. But you know the old story. Uh, You use campaign funds to buy copies of your own book, and then the pack owns the books, and you store them in a warehouse somewhere, and then like maybe give them away as gifts at a fundraising dinner, where you're raising even more money for the probably for the pack that you're going to use to buy more books. But you know every attendee at the fundraiser gets a copy of my book. Wow, that's so exciting! But it's the sort of thing that you're expected to smile and nod through while you're passing checks uh, at fundraisers. You're supposed to pretend that you like the person that you're there raising money for and that you're appreciative of having their book. Anyway, over the course of 2020, the Cruise affiliated Jobs Freedom and Security Pack. It's not even like a clever name that spells anything. J- now, if it had been like Jobs Freedom and uh, Constitution Pack, a JFC. That would have been kind of funny, <laughs> JFC Pack. But it's JFS. It doesn't spell anything. It's not his initials or anything. It's and it's just Republican tripe, you know. Jobs, freedom, and security. It didn't even mention Texas. Anyway, the Cruz affiliated Jobs, Freedom, and Security Pack, which I guess they were saying was his leadership pack, paid one point two million dollars which is a lot for books, and they note here nearly 80% of its operating budget to a company called Reagan Investments, LLC. And if there's nobody named Reagan working there, that's just kind of disgusting. And then, of course, the fact that you're named Reagan is kind of disgusting. But anyway, 
Why did they pay it for uh, to them? For, quote, sponsorship advertising. Except, you know, what does that mean? Well, you know, it could be doing anything. They could be placing ads for the pack or for crews or I don't know. Could be all sorts of things, but it's it's still a mystery. The only other committee to register any disbursements to that company, Reagan Investments LLC, was Trump Make America Great Again, which I guess is just one of the super PACs that's affiliated with Trump. Why did they pay it? For a fundraising promotion for Cruz's books in December. I don't know if I understand exactly the relationship here, but... This, according to the New York Times, which I guess we could <clears throat> look in their report and try and figure out exactly what it was. By the way, that report is, uh, let's see, well, the the URL, uh, or, or rather the window when it opens up, I guess they must have changed the headline at some point. I guess the original headline was, How Trump is Pocketing Donors' Cash for the Future. The current headline on the piece in the New York Times is Trump's sleight of hand, shouting fraud, comma, pocketing donors cash for future. So that probably bears some investigation as well. It's a February 4th piece, though. So we'll set that aside for now and continue on with the Salon piece because it focuses on Ted Cruz, who sucks and is in the news today. All right. Uh, Where are we? Ah, yeah. So the only other committee to register any payments to Reagan investments was Trump make America great again, which is a weird name for a pack and just sounds like somebody who doesn't understand punctuation has named it. But, you know, in the name, there's not going to be any. However, the Trump group clearly marked the payment for collateral colon books. Campaign finance experts told Salon that the PAC's payment classifications, all of them for sponsorship advertising, that is the the cruise pack, was unusual and opaque. So how do you like that? Just as a starter, the Trump-affiliated pack that paid Reagan Investments LLC did it more by the books and more transparently than the cruise organization that did that. Uh, That's one thing. Then, of course, we puzzle over, well, why would you call your company Reagan anything? Then why Reagan Investments, LLC? And the investment is uh, Trump PAC gives them money for collateral colon books. They're buying books as co- you know for collateral, campaign collateral, things you would give away. I mean, that's actually quite transparent, even if the operation itself is kind of underhanded and dirty. Um, but... Reagan Investments. What kind of investment is buying campaign collateral in the form of books? What kind of investment is Cruz making by buying books but calling it sponsorship advertising? And said, what business has an investment operation gotten either of those things? Well, different story. Anyway, January 4th, 2021. The day Cruz traveled to Georgia before the runoff elections, his leadership PAC reported a $240,000 expense for sponsorship advertising to Reagan Investments, which appears to correlate with another series of small dollar donations that poured into the PAC over the next few days. It isn't clear how much of the funds raised, if any, went to the Republican runoff campaigns. Cruz's PAC only spent a few thousand dollars in support of former Senator Kelly Loeffler. In fact, most of the contributions rolled in after the runoffs were over and as the events surrounding the January 6th insurrection were playing out, while Cruz joined a handful of Republican senators to object to the counting of Electoral College votes. Uh, By the way, most likely use for that money, the few thousand dollars spent in support of Kelly Loeffler, Probably his plane tickets to and from Georgia were the expenses paid there. A leadership pack can pay those expenses legally. And so he wasn't going to do that for free. And Loeffler probably wasn't going to pay to fly him down, even though she's a multimillionaire. Uh, so most likely 
that was the outgoing money of the, the few thousand dollars that was uh, identified as having been spent in support of Kelly Loeffler. But the rest of it, yeah, $240,000 goes for more quote-unquote sponsorship advertising to Reagan Investments. And then a bunch of small dollar donations come into the pack to replace that money that they just sent to this shadow company for the purchase of books. Legal experts tell Salon that if the money was for promotional book sales, as the filings may suggest, then the leadership pack could be using Reagan Investments as a pass-through to allow crews to keep the royalties, which are generally between 10 and 15% for hardcover books, and about half that for paperbacks. Political candidates are now not allowed to do that through their campaign committees, and maybe that now includes their leadership pack, so a leadership pack can no longer, is what they're suggesting, perhaps buy uh, the books themselves, so they pay another company to buy the books instead. You get the idea. Uh, not not a really solid firewall, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and they know all about trying to build barrier walls, but uh, they know when to build them porously, too. Anyway, though, the identity of Reagan Investments itself poses a mystery. The PAX filings claim that Reagan Investments LLC is located in an office building across the street from the Texas State Capitol in Austin. Uh, and I guess they have no power there now. And it's cold and no one wants to investigate. The company does not appear in Texas business registries. Open corporate records, however, show that a company by that name was organized in Missouri on January 23rd, 2020, two days after the PAC reported its first ever payment to the company of about $57,000. The agent on that registration, Jason Thomas III, was involved with a scheme that unlawfully funneled dark money from a conservative nonprofit to a political committee, resulting in a $350,000 FEC fine in 2018. So you might ask, for instance, uh, if you were starting a new company and you needed an agent for the company to be the contact point for legal purposes for your company, would you hire a person who had just been involved in a scheme that ended up in a $350,000 FEC fine? And the answer is, if you're a Democrat and you don't want to look bad, the answer is no, you don't hire that person. If you're a Republican and you don't care or you think it's funny or trolling to look bad in that way, <clears throat> and uh, let's own the libs by continuing to steal money with the guy who helped us steal money last time, then I guess the answer is yes. In a phone interview, they called up uh, Jason Thomas III and asked him some questions. Good. Uh, Thomas claimed he was simply the organizing agent and could not immediately recall who op operated the company or its purpose. It's possible. I mean, there are some people, it's not a really super ethical practice, but who just hire themselves out as local agents for a company that's basically designed to be a shell company and they just need a human being to use. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be using the company for nefarious purposes. But, you know, if you're going to be in that business and it is, it's, I mean, it's actually a legitimate line of work, but you probably, you know, those people are probably trying to shield themselves from finding out whether the companies they ostensibly represent our shady companies <clears throat> because then they wouldn't be able to accept a lot of the payments that they otherwise collect for, you know, the service of putting their name down as being a local agent. And you're supposed to, you know, accept service of process, you know, so when one of these shady companies does something terrible and they get subpoenaed or sued, uh, you will accept process for them and notify the attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, also when you select your agent who's been already involved in a situation that's resulted in a large uh, fine by the FEC, uh, maybe you would be more careful going forward. But if your job is to facilitate this stuff and not ask questions, I guess you don't do it. Uh, another one of Greg's many sayings, right? When somebody's job, their income, their livelihood depends on not learning something, you can be pretty sure that they won't. All right. Well, it's a modification of it. The company's address in Austin, not Missouri, Austin now, 
uh, matches that of an office suite occupied by a Missouri-based consulting firm called Axiom Strategies, not Axios, but Axiom Strategies, founded in 2005 by Jeff Rowe, who managed Cruz's ill-fated 2016 presidential campaign and advised his successful 2018 re-election contest against Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. You remember that, of course. <clears throat> Roe was also connected to the dark money scheme, and although the FEC did not cite Roe for a violation, Thomas told investigators that he primarily took direction from Roe. That was nice. Good. Stab him in the back while he's not looking. That's, I'm fine with that. Uh, that's interesting. And also, I guess, the connection to the 2016 presidential campaign. Of course, you remember that he was an opponent, uh, ostensibly, of Trump's at the time, <clears throat> which makes things a little bit awkward. And it's also a little awkward. They still collaborate on things. I can't imagine Trump cares for Cruz very much, even though Cruz is doing everything he can to suck up to Trump. Uh, I'm sure that's annoying and distasteful to Trump, but okay, so he'll accept it. Um, but uh, I just want to remind everybody of the weird connection between the two of them in the early going in the 2016 campaign. Uh, you'll remember that the Mercers, right? Rebecca Mercer and what's it? Robert Mercer, who's multi-billions of dollars uh, include funding such projects as Cambridge Analytica and underwriting all of Steve Bannon's political operations, that the Mercers were initially involved in the 2016 cycle backing Ted Cruz and establishing multiple uh, super PACs you know, not officially affiliated with, but clearly, you know, but but unofficially affiliated with. You're not supposed to have that coordination, but they can be affiliated with Ted Cruz. But they had, I think that they, if I recall correctly, they established like three different super PACs, all similarly named, like obviously so, so that it was like, you know, I don't remember the name of the pack, but then it was, you know, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. It was obviously intended to be viewed as uh, multiple affiliates, of the same campaign, but the, the Mercers pretty quickly were, I guess, by Steve Bannon, talked into switching their allegiances. And when it certainly when it looked like Cruz was going nowhere and Trump might, they did switch over. So it's interesting that there's this connection also in these this weird axiom strategies and Reagan investments, LLC, et cetera, et cetera. Roe is the registered agent for Axiom's Texas branch. Salon visited the Austin suite, which appeared functional and furnished, but unoccupied. Was the power on? Jobs Freedom and Security PAC has also paid Axiom directly, according to federal filings. Throughout the first half of 2020, while Jobs Freedom and Security PAC spent hundreds of thousands in monthly advertising dollars with Reagan Investments, the PAC raised only a fraction of that amount per FEC records, and it is not immediately clear what Cruz was paying the company to do. In July, the committee began accepting regular donations in the thousands of dollars. But in October, after Cruz published his new book, One Vote Away, How a Single Supreme Court Seat Can Change History, which coincided, by the way, of course, with the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and then he went on the Ruthless podcast, which also, of course, coincided with her death. The PAC saw a sudden and sustained influx of flat donations in the kind of small dollar amounts that typically align with book promotions and packages. Those receipts continued to come in after the election and through December when the Trump campaign launched its cross-promotion. Cruz's leadership pack also supports active candidates and donated directly to a number of campaigns in the 2020 cycle, but it reported only $109,000 in independent expenditures. All of that in a June donation to support Texas congressional candidate Raul Reyes in a Republican primary, which he lost. Not a super successful operation down there. Furthermore, except for funneling money, which is the point of it. Furthermore, the PAC reported that it paid $615,000 to the Republican fundraising platform WinRed for credit card processing fees. Just processing fees. 
in January on January 12th, a week after the Reagan Investments advertising payout and after having paid WinRed only a few thousand dollars for all of 2020. The PAC's receipts total more than $758,000 in January alone, about 50% more than it raised from 2019 to 2020 combined. However, experts told Salon that without further clarification, the vague sponsored advertising classification stands in the way of drawing any conclusions. Senator Cruz spending nearly a quarter of a million dollars on sponsorship advertising is certainly odd and raises several questions into his leadership PAC's financial behavior, said Jenna Grande. Uh, might just be grand, but spelled like Grande. Press Secretary for Government Watchdog Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Crew, you know them. The group that filed the original FEC complaint detailing the dark money scheme involving Thomas and Rowe. So they're closely watching. Good job there. We would certainly welcome an explanation from him about these suspicious expenditures, she added. Brendan Fisher, director of federal reform at the Campaign Legal Center, echoed the point. I don't know that we can conclude that Reagan Investments LLC is a pass-through for book purchases, Fisher told Salon in an email. Trump MAGA described its payments, the, the actual PAC, Trump Make America Great Again, described its payments to Reagan Investments as collateral or books for books, whereas Cruz's leadership pack described every payment to Reagan Investments LLC as sponsorship advertising. Just because Trump's payments were for a specific purpose doesn't mean we can conclude Cruz's payments were for that same purpose when the payments were reported differently. Fisher continued, that said, are we ready for this? Okay. That said, I really don't know what sponsorship advertising means. And it looks like Cruz's leadership pack was the only political committee that reported payments for that purpose in the entire 2020 election cycle. From anyone to anyone, I guess. Cruz's failure to meaningfully disclose how his leadership pack is spending its money means we can only guess about where the million plus ultimately went. There's more to it. Perhaps we'll conclude with this article uh, after this break. We'll be right back. Just a short one. All right. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's conclude this piece and see if I can't uh, stop commenting on it uh, at every twist and turn. But it's hard not to in a story like this. Um, let's see. We'll finish this up. If Reagan Investments is a means for Cruz to collect publishing royalties, the senator would appear to be converting donations to personal use and possibly filing false FEC reports. If that were the case, Jeff Rowe could potentially be considered a co-conspirator. Candidates who sponsor leadership PACs are generally allowed to use donor funds for personal expenses, meaning Cruz could keep any royalties but the FEC currently has a pending review of a related question, whether the personal use exemption should extend to leadership PACs that belong to active candidates such as Cruz. An unfavorable ruling could have implications for Trump's leadership PAC, Save America. If the former president decides to run again in 2024, he may not have unfettered personal access to the millions of dollars in the PAC's account. And that could circumscribe his ability to spend those contributions on his personal business empire. Hmm. And I'm sure that was his aim, although it was just to pocket it in any way possible. But yeah, uh, a reminder that this relates back to a story we've discussed in passing, I think, but certainly a couple times in the past few weeks. The amount of money that Trump raised post-2020 election which he raised in the context of the Georgia runoffs and his efforts to sue his way back into the presidency, but for and for which he ended up raising some $75 million, but on which projects he spent nearly zero dollars of that money. And everyone's been wondering, gee whiz, what's he going to do with all of this money stored away in Save America PAC? Uh, sales for Cruz's 2015 book, I guess by way of comparison, that book entitled A Time for Truth, which it wasn't, drew scrutiny after the New York Times refused to put it on the bestseller list. Remember this? Citing strategic bulk purchases that appeared inorganic, prompting Amazon to push back on the paper's claim. 
I guess Amazon didn't want to be viewed as a funnel for this stuff, but uh, the New York Times is probably at some point going to become pretty adept at recognizing when a book that is boring and stupid and doesn't have anything to recommend it <clears throat> suddenly goes from, you know, nowhere on the bestseller list to, you know, uh, into the top 10 uh, all from sales all made on one day. You know, OK, come on, give me a break. Is that really going to happen? So. All right. Uh, he's he clearly knows about the strategic bulk purchasing game. Whether or not he can still manipulate it to get on the New York Times bestseller list is probably immaterial to him. Uh, he just wants the money. Harper Collins, the 2015 Cruise Books publisher, uh, said it had investigated the sales pattern but found no evidence of bulk orders or sales through any retailer or organization. Uh, yeah, let me uh, research that. Oh, look, I researched it and I haven't found anything. Cruz's new book, by the way, published by the conservative-oriented publishing house Regnery Press. They've been discussed on the show a number of times. That's uh, where you go when no one else will touch you. When Josh Hawley lost his publishing contract in the wake of the insurrection, uh, uh, he landed on his feet where? At Regnery. So that'll give you some idea of what's going on here. In 2015, Cruz could be handled by Harper Collins. By 2020, only Regnery would deal with them. Anyway, the Cruz campaign immediately put out a press release demanding that the Times, way back when, either offer evidence of its claims about strategic bulk purchases or apologize. I don't know if they did either one, and uh, who cares. The Times is presumably embarrassed by having their obvious partisan bias called out, but their response, alleging strategic bulk purchases, is a blatant falsehood. Campaign spokesperson Rick Tyler told Politico at the time, the evidence is directly to the contrary. In leveling this false charge, the Times has tried to impugn the integrity of Senator Cruz and of his publisher HarperCollins. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, they both suck, and I want to impugn their integrity, too. The Cruz campaign did not immediately respond to Salon's request for comment by email or phone. The campaign's outgoing voicemail informs callers that book orders will take four to six weeks to fulfill citing an allegedly high demand. So, gee whiz. All right, well, developing situation and just another reason to hate Ted Cruz. But if somebody calls you out and says, well, you're just a Ted Cruz hater, you have no basis for it, now you have some basis for it. I mean, there's other bases, but uh, if you want some new one, you got this. All right, what else have we got here? Uh, oh, yes, I meant to uh, bring this up, a, a tweet thread that I saw yesterday uh, when I mentioned that CPAC was going on. And I guess, is it still going on? I don't even monitor these things. But uh, the observation from Will Steakin, I hope that's how he pronounces the last name, unless it's Steakin, like that's how it's spelled, like like steak, like uh, I'm, I'm Steakin, I'm, I'm grilling a bunch of steaks, right? S-T-E-A-K-I-N. Could be Steakin, though. Uh, ABC News 2020 campaign reporter, among other things, uh, Will tweets that CPAC is seemingly not turning away from many of the election fraud claims that led to the January 6th Capitol riot. Rather, it is leaning in. Uh, so included in his tweets here, screenshot of the New York Times uh Is this a, a headline of a story or a pull quote from a story? I can't tell. Cleta Mitchell a lawyer who was on Trump's Georgia call, you know all about those, has quietly aided efforts to overturn the election. That, I guess, probably from around the time of the call. Uh, but that side by side with the tweet from CPAC itself, noting that Cleta Mitchell is a national election law expert who will share her on the ground experiences in Georgia and the true facts about what happened on November 3rd and since then at CPAC 2021, uh, this time being held in Orlando rather than, uh, as is often or usually the case, in the Washington, D.C. area. But they're having it down in Orlando this time, and uh, that's probably because they're the only place that will allow uh, large gatherings of that size, and also it'll be that much easier for Trump to make his way over there to speak if that's what he wants to do. But I think he's too lazy to do that. 
Uh, what else here? A bunch of, he says, bunch of CPAC panels will center around claims Dems had a, quote, shadow campaign in 2020 and, quote, pulled the strings and covered it up. Only weeks after a mob of pro-Trump supporters stormed the Capitol to stop the certification of the election results over false claims that it was stolen. So again, leaning in on those things uh, of the names that are uh, involved in the panel called Shining a Light on the Left's 2020 Shadow Campaign, uh, of which I don't think there was any. but, But there was recently, I think, like a Newsweek article that made a claim of some sort of shadow campaign happening, but I don't, I think shadow was probably a terrible name for it because there was nothing nefarious or illegal about it. It was just parallel to the Biden campaign, a pro, you know, vote democratic sort of campaign, but I'll see if I can't find that thing. I don't know that uh, I believed in what they, I don't know. Well, we'll see if I can find it in pocket and let you know what we're talking about. But the four names on the panel, including the, moderator, Alan Fuller of the American Conservative Union. I don't recognize uh, but one of those names, David Bossy, who's listed here as representing Citizens United, which I'm sure sends a tingle up the leg of everybody at CPAC, but of course he lately of the Trump White House. Other on the panel, others on the panel, Kristen Eastlick, Capital Research Center, Aaron Ginn, co-founder of the Lincoln Network, which I don't know what it is, and I don't know if it's brand new or if it's supposed to draw people away from the Lincoln Project or something. I don't know which. Uh, others on panels uh, alleging the same thing. Another panel, Protecting Elections Part 1, Voting is Democracy, Why We Must Protect Elections. DeRoy Murdoch of the National Review, Protecting Elections Part 2, Other Culprits, Why Judges and Media Refused to Look at the Evidence. Uh, On the panel, moderated by Denise Cohen, also of the American Conservative Union Foundation. Oh, I'm sorry, not just the American Conservative Union, but the American Conservative Union Foundation. No doubt their 501c4 uh, affiliate that can allow people to deduct donations that they make to them, though they are used just as politically as those that might be made to the American Conservative Union, which is not tax deductible. But also on the panel, former Nevada Attorney General Adam Laxalt, also himself scion of a uh, political dynasty, um, uh, son of Paul, I guess, Laxalt is a son, or maybe he's a, maybe he's a nephew, who knows. Uh, But speaking of political dynasties, as we were the other day, uh, with respect to the Brent Bozells of the world and the Buckleys, William F. Buckley as well. Lots of new tweets, by the way, uh, on that subject. That's something I can share with you later on, too. Uh, And also third person on the panel, familiar name, Hans von Spakovsky, now of the Heritage Foundation on a panel about uh, protecting elections, which is, of course, exactly the opposite of what he does professionally. But how about that? Still harping on it and still harping on the same this harping on the same word salad that Marjorie Taylor Greene was harping on yesterday. She had one of the like the least sensible, least understandable word salad tweets I've seen her make. Uh, But alleging something along the same lines, but she just, I mean, she couldn't put an argument together in this tweet. It was really just the worst kind of word salad. And uh, maybe I can find it quickly and uh, read it to you. You likely saw the tweet, but uh, I'm interested in it because, you know, I don't know what she was doing the rest of the day, but she managed to find herself time to to tweet this thing and and it's it's in parallel to this this uh panel i guess why judges and media refuse to look at the evidence and then she had tweeted yesterday uh the supreme court refuses to hear a case about the american people's elections based on standing not evidence so okay so it's related in that sense but then look at her the rest of her tweet spins out of control who pays for elections the people's taxes do. Okay, so bring it home. Give me a a conclusion here. 
like the people pay for elections to be run, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the up and up and the, the, the Supreme Court too. they're public servants. They they owe us a look at the evidence as opposed to dismissing things on standing. Um, you know, bad argument, but OK, at least it makes an argument. But this is how it comes together. The Supreme Court refuses to hear a case about the American people's elections based on standing, not evidence. Who pays for elections? The people's taxes, too. But the Supreme Court ruled that President Trump's personal tax records can be handed over. Let that sink in, she says at the at the end. Like, oh my God, that, that, that what's sinking in is, but that doesn't have anything to do with the other thing. Those are just two events that were in the news yesterday regarding, you know, tangentially in some cases, regarding the Supreme Court. <clears throat> there was a Supreme Court uh, ruling, a decision that they wouldn't take up Trump's appeal of the case in which he was trying to prevent the Manhattan district attorney from getting hold of his tax records. Yes, the Supreme Court was involved in that. It shouldn't have been. It really should never have been appealed that far. But Trump wants to appeal everything. So he brought it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, this is not even a Supreme Court worthy case. Get out of here. And that made Marjorie Taylor Greene upset because it was a blow to Trump. And everyone knows she's the only one who wants to give blows to Trump, I guess. I don't know really why she wants to do that or why that would occur to me, but it did. Uh, but also uh, that the Supreme Court had earlier, like a month ago, two months ago at this point, refused to hear various stupid elections cases because uh, one, there was no standing. But, you know, in most of those cases, uh, the courts even sometimes took time to say so. I don't think the Supreme Court ever did, but other courts took the time to say, even if there was standing, there's also no justiciable claim being made here, no injury demonstrated, no remedy that the court is empowered to deliver. So if it wasn't standing, it was going to be something else. But the the easiest way to let you down gently is to say that you have a standing problem. But if you want us to look at the evidence, we still can't get to the evidence because you're not making a justiciable claim. In other words, you've come into a courtroom and said, I'm sad, and then asked for relief. Well, you know, uh, just to entertain you for a little bit, what sort of relief were you looking for? Like uh, a, a tax penalty for somebody or uh, uh, invalidating an election or anything at all? No, they were asking for this weird hybrid thing. Like, I want you to not count Democratic votes, but count Republican votes. Don't don't uh, invalidate the election. Just declare me the winner of it instead. And like, we don't do that guy. And the only way to dismiss this case without saying the problem here is that you have come to the court as an idiot and not a lawyer. And so we will smack you in the face and tell you you're stupid. Or we could say, well, blah, 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 standing and pretend that you guys are still lawyers. Anyway, Marjorie Taylor Greene weaves these two things together. The Supreme Court wouldn't hear a case because of standing. <clears throat> and Americans pay for elections. And it was an election case, so it was important they should have heard it. And another thing, the court also said that because Trump paid taxes, those records should be turned over to somebody. And you also pay tax. It's real. I mean, it's the worst kind. There's no connection. There's no connective tissue whatsoever. And then she's let that sink in. And it doesn't sink in any further than person, man, woman, camera, TV. That, let that sink in. That doesn't make any sense either. But and so putting let that sink in at the end doesn't make whatever garbage you just said deep or meaningful like wow i'm gonna to have to think about that let that sink in all right sinking 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 marjorie taylor green is a moron that's what i got it sank in and it went through the filter and that's what came out because there's no value to what she said anyway so over at cpac presumably they're trying to put together a better argument about this there's a part three by the way of protecting elections the left pulled strings, covered it up, and even admits it, which is, of course, the opposite of covering it up. But what the hell? Let's put all of that in a single title. Uh, who would be dumb enough to title their panel that? Uh, and there's no other participants of the panel 
on this one listed anyway. It just says, former Representative Jason Chaffetz, now a Fox News contributor. He's responsible for, they covered it up and then also didn't cover it up. Here's my report. Okay. Well, they're, they're dumb and they're in Orlando. That's the upshot of that. Uh, moving on. Uh, lots of excellent reporting these days about, uh, more about, like I said, we learn every day more about what's going on uh, or what went on at the insurrection. And I mentioned to you yesterday, and I eventually did find the source for it, that uh, the Oath Keepers, who along with the Proud Boys and others have been uh, indicted in uh, uh, separately and for a particular role in the insurrection, uh, have some members affiliated with them for who, uh, gosh, uh, there are some very weird developments as well, just in terms of nonsensical claims that uh, just, well, uh, I'm glad the Times looked into it. Anyway, the Times uh, tweeting yesterday uh, the highlights of their rather lengthy piece, um, uh, which uh, I mentioned on the air yesterday, a small group of militants outsize role in the Capitol attack. Uh, a very, not all that long of a piece, but uh, I, I imagine it would be quicker to go run through the highlights in their tweet thread about the piece. And that goes like this. As federal prosecutors unveil charges in the assault on the Capitol, they've highlighted two militant groups, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, as having done the most premeditation. And there's a nice Venn diagram using ellipses uh, rather than circles, because they can't fit everybody in a, a circle that's small enough to fit in a graphic that fits in a tweet, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, they go on to say, the groups differ in their focus and tactics, but conspiracy charges indicate that members of both may have worked together. Of the 22 people charged with conspiracy crimes, 18 were known to have ties to one of those two groups, or I guess at least one of those two groups, because it looks like there's some overlap between them. More than a third of the militants were also known to have military experience. It stands to reason. Think about the root of the word. A far higher proportion than in the crowd as a whole. Of the 31 group members who have been charged so far, at least 11 had a military record. This may have been intentional. They elaborate on all of this, of course, in the longer piece. Although people with extremist ideologies represent a small fraction of military veterans, far-right organizations heavily recruit them because of their skills, said Peter D. Favor, um, F-E-A-V-E-R, a political science professor at Duke University. The cooperation between these two groups, along with the military experience within their ranks, enabled them to play an outsized role in the capital attack and then, of course, you can read more in that piece, which I would read you, but for the fact that it would probably mean we'd uh, have to suspend reading in the middle for the break, and then we'll be talking to Joan. And, I mean, I think the subject matter at this point is probably pretty well known to you, and a pretty good chance that you may already have read the article. There's another Times piece out there. Uh, this one also alluded to yesterday in the... Um, supposition that uh, the dumb charge that Nancy Pelosi may have uh, ordered some sort of stand down from the Capitol Police in order to make sure that there was a spectacular event during the insurrection for which uh, Democrats could then blame Republicans, uh, but that in all likelihood, in fact, Mitch McConnell, then in charge of the Senate, would have been on the same page and have agreed to the same uh, security arrangements at the time. This uncovered in the Times piece, the lost hours, how confusion and inaction at the Capitol delayed a troop deployment, I guess specifically aimed at looking at <clears throat> what happened with the deployment of the National Guard, and that likely to uncover a lot of premeditation and planning and deliberate uh, uh, denial of authority ahead of time from the White House and elsewhere in the executive branch as well. So I recommend that piece 
uh, be uh, thumbed through as well, and I'm going to have to spend some time reading through that one. Uh, let's see, other things that require uh, further mention. Okay, that's another copy of the Times piece about the Oath Keepers. Uh, this was the Kyle Cheney tweet about it that I mentioned yesterday that said that uh, McConnell was probably on the same page. Now, uh, an interesting look at the member of the Oath Keepers who said that she met with the Secret Service before the Capitol riot. Uh, I know that there's more information about this person in another tweet thread as well, but uh, one of the things that we didn't get to mention yesterday was I was just sort of surprised, but this really wasn't a, a turn I was expecting. I, I thought it was unusual. It said, oh, uh, you know, Oath Keepers, generally a male organization. Uh, this, I guess, is one, uh, I don't know if it's the only one, but uh, their first mention of a transgender member of the Oath Keepers that I've ever seen. And this was the person that we were mentioning yesterday, as it happens, who was talking or claimed to have been talking to Secret Service agents ahead of the attack, although I think there was some confusion about why they were talking and whether there was any legitimate reason to be talking to a Secret Service agent and whether they were talking about what became the attack on the Capitol or talking about what had started as the rally at the Ellipse is unclear. Again, though, this is Jessica Watkins, 38-year-old member of the Oath Keepers, listed here in this Reuters piece as one of nine associates of the anti-government group charged with conspiring to storm the Capitol to prevent Congress from certifying President Joe Biden's election victory. Uh, again, just as a reminder, the lawyers claim that she did not engage in any violence or force at the Capitol grounds. But again, this was the one whose lawyers' filings claimed that she had been duped by the president into participating in all of this. And I don't know whether she was sorry about being duped, but that, that, that this was somehow Trump's fault for getting her involved in the whole thing and lying to her about what was going on. And that's what motivated it. And at any rate, who cares? Because... Uh, I didn't do any violence anyway. I was just there, and my job was to escort people back to their cars safely after a peaceful gathering at the Capitol. But also, I snaked my way through the crowd, uh, arms on shoulders, and entered the Capitol at some point, uh, I guess to escort people to their cars, which might be parked in the Capitol. But then finding no cars, I peacefully exited. Anyway, it didn't make a great deal of sense. Plus, of course, she also uh, please, pleads <clears throat> that uh, the real damage was, in fact, done by Antifa, which is kind of an internally inconsistent claim. I was there, and I didn't do any violence, but also uh, I wasn't there. It was really Antifa. I don't know. We'll have to sort that stuff out. Uh, it's the court's job now. I just thought that was an interesting development. I wasn't ex I. I didn't think of the Oath Keepers as the kind of place that would, I guess, accept transgender members, but uh, huzzah for them on that score? <sighs> I don't know. Maybe they'd be doing people bigger favors if they said, uh, it's really best for you if you don't associate in general. That you're transgender, uh, it's just another problem on top of the difficulty of living as a transgender person as it is. You don't want any really nefarious associations like the Oath Keepers on your resume, so to speak, on your CV. So uh, why don't we just keep things light and you just live as a transgender person uh, with all of the difficulties that that entails all by itself? Uh, and not complicate your life by making things truly bad for yourself by becoming an oath keeper. That's the sort of thing you want to avoid. Okay, Whew. time now for our uh, get our run up to the third break, and hopefully Joan McCarter will be available to join us. But lots of confirmation hearings happening on Capitol Hill, so that's a possibility that her may, attention may be on some of those things. Uh, and hey, if so, plenty more to discuss. 
but we'll but we'll miss having her. And we'll find out after our break. And usually when I say things like this, so we get a message very shortly thereafter saying, yes, I'm listening. I'm, I'm coming. Don't worry about it. Uh, that may be the case as well. Uh, if I don't get to it, let me at least recommend this piece in the 20 seconds I've got left. Uh, just by from the headline alone, a piece by Laurie Garrett in Foreign Policy magazine. You'll find it at foreignpolicy.com. Trump is guilty of pandemicide, an interesting term that you might want to pick up and carry forward on your own, perhaps in social media. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan is with us. Just filling her in on the, the news that uh, we, we all have reason to give polite golf clap applause to the Oath Keepers for being inclusive. Uh, but that's, I guess, where the appreciation ends. Um, but yeah, many hearings going on today, a lot of information coming out, and of course, uh, lots of legislative activity as Congress returns. And I assume that's on, on your radar today. Is that right? It's very much on my radar, as usual. Okay. Lucky me with Congress, huh? Yay. <laughs> they gave it all to you. Uh, well, yeah, we should see about recruiting like uh, ex-staffers at some point and say, oh, well, we could use your expertise and then kind of slowly uh, pull the... <laughs> Jump it onto them. <laughs> right. Pull the rug out at the end. Ah, guess what? Cover it at all times. <laughs> you can, uh, yeah, refocus your efforts elsewhere. Ah, I'm sure we'll work that out. But uh, there is interesting stuff going on. Uh, I met, I saw that Merrick Garland, I guess, was in yesterday. Is he still yes. in hearings today? Or I think they they're having follow-up hearings today, yes. Okay. Although there's really no, mm, no more mystery there. Stuff. He's he's going to make it fine. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, he makes it. Possibly even with Lindsey Graham, who the hearing yesterday was kind of frustrating. <laughs> Because, oh. of course, it was because it's Republicans. Yeah. Uh, focusing on Hunter Biden and on the um, <laughs> okay the special counsel who is investigating the special counsel investigation of Russia <laughs> interference in the election. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. The usual. The usual. Mm -hmm. All right. So some follow-up work on that one today and uh, other hearings today of importance. Uh Anybody else confirmation? Yep, Holland today ah, okay. at Interior, and that's a big one. Yeah. Um, we've already got Joe Manchin sniffing that he's unlikely to support her because Joe Manchin. Oh. Um, yeah. You know, he, he is <laughs> what? remarkably, what a surprise, somehow picking women of color to oppose. That is you know, odd. Their cabinet hmm. position. Yeah, uh, and catching some well-deserved heat for it. I mean, he, yeah, I maybe he wants to pick one to let through to, you know, to, to support, not just let through, but to say, you know, uh, I better get myself out of this. Just uh, well, him. yeah, after he supported so many of Trump's nominees. Yeah, well, including I'd advise him. William Jefferson yeah. Sessions the third. Wasn't that his name? Uh, yeah, I think Jefferson's there was a Beauregard in there too. Beauregard, there's a Beauregard in there. Yeah. Oh, Jefferson Beauregard different. Sessions, that's it. Yeah. Uh, right, and uh, who else? I mean, who, at this point, hey, you, you, support it. you support one, that's enough. Uh, so tougher on, on on Biden's nominees, perhaps, than than Trump's. But, uh, yeah, it would be unwise to be. It's not a good look. It's, it's not, and especially if it is, if it turns out to be, yeah, all of the women of color nominated 
and there will be many because, you know, we care about actually having a cabinet that looks like America. And uh, I guess Joe Manchin wants it to look like West Virginia, which <laughs> I guess is different. so. Eh, I, I guess that's the best what justification. Joe Manchin, wants. Joe Manchin wants to grandstand. Joe Manchin wants to be the kingmaker. He yeah. wants to put himself in a position where everybody has to come to him to beg. And unfortunately, a 50-50 Senate allows that. Yeah. Um, Manchin could be yeah. saying, you want my vote on the stimulus package? On the one point nine trillion. Yeah. You got it. This is this is the price of it. I'm gonna be an asshole when yeah. it comes to your nominees. Well, yeah, and you know, some of it I would have predicted as, you know, being performative. He's got a oh, I wanna show I'm independent and not just uh doing whatever Biden wants. So on cabinet nominees occasionally you'll probably end up searching around. Well who can I oppose for some reason that's supportable or arguable anyway, but but show that as well. You know, I didn't vote for everybody Biden nominated. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, as it turns out, uh, right out of the gate, it, it, it carries a different problem with it. There will be more other nominees if you want to, like, symbolically oppose them. But maybe one yeah. of the women you should say, yeah, I changed my mind. Pick, pick, a, pick a white guy to oppose. Yeah. Just to... I mean, yeah, if you really want to show you're independent, right? You know, not only am I independent of Biden, I'm independent of white guys. That's a thing you could do, but I don't know. I don't run in West Virginia. So we'll see. Uh, he might he not run in elsewhere. West Virginia again, which makes oh. it even weirder. I guess that's true, too. Like, don't worry about it so much then. But, okay. Uh, he'll cause problems elsewhere, possibly, or certainly could stand in the way of of other things. All things will be close votes, I guess, on big, heavy lift legislation. Everything is going to be close votes because we're 50-50 yeah. and people in the Senate. Vote that way now, and as opposed to, is the bill good? Uh, who right. wrote it? Ah, that's right. different. So the, the the focus, of course, this week is the one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief bill. Yes. Okay. That's a good focus. Which was combined nine bills from nine committees were combined yesterday by the House Budget Committee, and it was passed out. All right. I would have passed without too. damaging Republican amendments, although they, you know, they tried. Sure. It's okay. Sort of a mini voterama in the Budget Committee with Republicans putting up. Crazy amendment after crazy amendment to try to, yeah. because that's what they do. Even though right. nobody is paying to paying any attention to the House Budget Committee and what it's doing, and true, nobody's true. going to count these votes, these amendments, mm. in the long run. That's what they do. Yeah, well, that's all they have available to them. Lauren Boebert is on the Budget Committee, so I imagine she said, uh, you know, uh, uh, no money for anything but guns or something like that, or every American should get a free gun. <laughs> I don't know what she might propose, but probably gun-related because she doesn't do anything else. I'm undoubtedly gun-related. Oh, she did sign on to a letter saying that the extremist nominee for HHS should be, that that would be Xavier Becerra. <laughs> okay. Was was sure. extremist and 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 she was opposed to him. I so, see. All right. You know. Well, he's not. And she Marjorie is. Taylor Greene also signed on to that letter. Oh, okay. Well, what else is she going to do? You know, she's got a lot of free time, so yeah, no, no committee meetings to go to. <laughs> yeah. So. so sign anything, and I noticed she put some effort into the weird word salad tweet. Yes, I'm sure there were several, but uh, I was just sort of taken aback by the lack of cohesion in her weird tweet about the Supreme Court both uh, refusing to look at the evidence in the election cases and requiring Trump to turn over his taxes and how that was somehow connected and let that sink in. Like, what? Don't know what you're talking about. But... Uh, you know, while uh, we're talking, Georgia, we got the news okay. during the show. I don't know if you saw it that Purdue's not going to try for re election. Uh, no, I don't think I had seen that. Probably because that just came out. He just, just oh, said okay. that this morning after much prayer 
After prayer and reflection, Bonnie and I have decided we will not enter the race for United States Senate in Georgia in 2020, probably because he's not sure he can beat Marjorie Taylor Greene in a primary. (laughs) Wow. That's really There's something to think about. Marjorie Taylor Greene running for the Senate. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Maybe it and maybe it's a good thing. Like one, if you give up your house seat to do it, great. Uh, although who knows who's coming out of there next. And two, the fact that she's made such a splash at this point, and then saying I'm going to run statewide, where well, we've just shown what organization can do in a statewide race in Georgia. That would be a fine way to be rid of Marjorie Taylor Greene. But yeah, my hair will turn gray on the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was going to anyway, so I don't know what I'm waiting for. <laughs> I, <laughs> true enough. Might as well be now. Um, Shoo. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll watch that. But but it is amazing that you can – Marjorie Taylor Greene should not be in the position to intimidate anybody out of a race, especially a former senator running for election to the Senate. That's incredible. But it may just be, I want to be a day trader. That's true also. This is, well, that could be, I mean, he, he's making an awful lot of money outside of the Senate. Right, so, so keep doing you it. You know, he can do it without any, any. Right, he doesn't have to sneak around anymore. That's that's what I'm trying to think of. I'm, I'm having a difficult time finding words this day. I apologize. Oh, well, I'll give you a few. <laughs> You're full of words. Yeah. That's true. That's all I got. <laughs> Uh, okay. well, anyway, yeah. back to the cool. House Budget Committee did its work. Okay. And, yes, and the bill is passed out. And next up is Rules Committee, where they're waiting because in the next day or two, possibly even as soon as today, the parliamentarian is going to decide on whether the minimum wage increase okay. can stay in the bill in the Senate if it will pass muster as a reconciliation bill ah, yeah. on the Senate side. Right. So that's sort of the main thing that there might be a couple of other things that we're having to think about with the Senate parliamentarian and whether it meets the rules there um, for the house rules committee to consider. So they okay. may be doing some marking up and amending there um, what they take to the floor to to alter the bill okay but Makes we are sense. expecting it to um pass in the house friday maybe saturday if it takes a while okay all right so, so the, the work the will be done there then it'll immediately go to the senate where they have until well we say they have until march 14th when um the unemployment benefits expire from the previous round okay yes i got you. but Really, they don't have that long because the antiquated systems that all of the states are using for unemployment benefits are so clunky that they really need as much lead time as possible before these expirations happen in order to not have any disruption in sending out benefits. So if the Senate can do it next week, all the better. Yes. I guess one of these days there ought to be some appropriations somewhere for... Uh, modernizing the unemployment disbursement systems so that we're not constantly facing this problem of uh, even if you pass a renewal in time, people will experience disruption because of these dumb, clunky systems. But getting appropriations for an unemployment system past Republicans is probably near impossible. Yeah, and you can't do absolutely everything by reconciliation. (laughs) Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, unfortunately, I say... they're they're talking about potentially doing the infrastructure bill via reconciliation. Ah, um, and I don't know huh. how they work Why? it so that they can do two reconciliation bills this year, but they did. It is weird. It's unusual, and one of the things that people always said: remember, you can only do this once a year. And I, I always stood in the background saying, "Not really." Yeah, <laughs> but, but it never happens. So. I mean, there's yeah. a lot you can do. There is infrastructure as reconciliation. I would have thought that would have been a big opportunity for the big bipartisan 
cooperation bill. But <laughs> no, huh? Well, yeah. This is where um, the House and Senate Democrats' decision to bring back earmarks ah. factors in. Okay. So they may not have to do it via reconciliation if they think by using earmarks they can get enough Republican support. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I mean, right. Makes sense. And they could be right. I mean, I, you know, I am not one of these earmarks are the most horrible thing ever kinds of people because they actually are useful. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you elect particularly members of the House for, but also the Senate, is to bring stuff home yeah. to your state and to your district to, you know, spend money, create jobs, give yeah. us nice things. Yeah, they got a bad rap. I mean, some people abuse them, certainly, but uh, yeah, I mean, With essentially now I think we think of them differently. Rails, these are extremely useful and important things and kind of why we have members of the House. Yeah. That's a, so that we have nice things at home. Point. Yeah. I, you have a stake in the government, and it should be obvious that the government is doing many things for you. It is interesting that the, the reform of getting rid of earmarks because they sometimes got abused and certain members really piled them up. And then, of course, that alongside the... Republican concern with deficits that leaked into a Democratic concern with deficits because they didn't want Republic. Don't hurt us, please. We're on the same page about deficits. Uh, but all of that coincided with uh, with an extraordinary rise in Republican ranks of distrust for and hatred of government. And, you know, they've always sort of dismissed it as doing either too much or nothing. Anyway, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was uh, it kind of, I think, probably contributed to a little bit uh, to the extremism we see among uh, hard right Republican ranks now. Like, you know, you're, you, you can't, the government can't and won't do anything for you in your area. Uh, and it's not that we weren't spending money there. It's just that we weren't doing it via earmarks and there weren't members of Congress who were interested in going home and saying, yes, I've made the government do this for you people locally. And it, I guess with that not available, they instead went back and said, oh, you would actually rather hear me make a speech about how the government is terrible and I agree with you? All right. Yeah. And the government's right. terrible and I agree this with you. Fine. Well, and, uh, you know, hmm. I think that part of it was definitely on purpose. We we prove to you that the Demo that the government can't do sure. anything by oh, not letting it point. do anything by true too. undermining the IRS by undermining social security system by starving these essential functions so that they can't operate and we can prove to you that government doesn't work yeah well that's and, definitely a plan. you know you have the example of the consumer financial protection bureau which definitely was working hmm for individual people and the Republicans yeah. fought it tooth and nail and very nearly destroyed it in the Trump administration hmm. when it yeah. had um, sent billions and billions of dollars back to consumers who had been defrauded by various financial institutions. So they're doing it on purpose. They are working their very best to sabotage government at all levels because they don't want it to work. They want to be able to continue to go back to their constituents and say, it never works. It doesn't work. It's bad for you. It's harming you. It's trying to take your guns away. Mm -hmm. It's spying yeah. on you. Yeah. Well, it, it is. Well, but, yes, but, but, it is. But you it's guys should be your getting away. spied on. You're I mean, insurgents. It's taking your guns away. Yes. That's there. Yeah. Well, one thing we're not doing is taking any guns away. That hasn't happened. Uh, even when we spy on you and find out that you're planning on attacking federal buildings, we're not taking your guns, apparently. Yeah. So, okay. Well, Which is also the interesting hearing on the Hill today, going back to that, um, the ex capitol police chief and uh, various members of, of the Capitol Hill police 
are testifying yeah. in front of the Senate, including Josh Hawley uh-huh. and Ted Cruz. <laughs> yeah, those guys are on the Judiciary Committee together. Is that where they're doing this? Homeland Security. Oh, they're both on that too. Huh? It's not a lot of senators. I think Cruz is on it. Maybe not. Maybe it's just Hawley. Could be. I mean, wouldn't surprise me if that were the case, but... Uh, all right. Well, yeah, I read about Hawley uh, having that opportunity to uh, to question them today, and we'll see whether he do, he fares any better today than he did yesterday in hearings. I understand he didn't and Ron well. Johnson. Don't forget oh, Ron Johnson. Uh, I tried. Who said it was not an armed insurrection because only one person got shot? I think oh. that was his <laughs> rationale for saying it wasn't an armed insurrection. It was the big deal. Oh, wow. Well, you know, he may well have said that. It doesn't make any sense, but he may well have said that. Because it's Ron Johnson. Yeah, right. I mean, that's okay. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I I, I would have thought maybe they were going to try. Well, it wasn't an armed insurrection because, of course, all these people were gun owners and they, they didn't bring their guns, so they weren't armed, which, of course, you know, they brought other weapons. They brought plenty of guns. They, they may did not do have that had as well. There, but you know they had them in their pickups uh, parts on too. the outskirts. So they had lots and lots of guns. Yeah. And also, and this is one thing that's sort of mysterious to me: bombs. What happened yeah. to the bombs that were placed? Yeah, or like I guess the they still haven't identified or, the and person. the person who who placed them. So yeah, they've identified everybody else, but not this one. And uh, I mean, maybe it was just he was the only person that was smart enough not to buy to wear, you know, something personally identifying, you know, like their 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 school name or, you know, <laughs> or their name it's, or their business name. Or, if if you really want to see white privilege in action, it's these guys thinking that they could just show up at the Capitol, attack it, yeah. trespass into right. it, threaten lawmakers without any thought of hiding right. their identity. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder whether some of them thought, oh, this is great publicity. Like I saw the shot of one guy like wearing, you know, his tree service or landscaping service or whatever it was, you know, the business name named for him and his last name is in the business, but with a phone number and everything just on a hoodie that he's wearing, which it might be his favorite hoodie or something, but he might also be saying, what if some of my fellow insurgents need trees trimmed? <laughs> I should drum up this business. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, or may I also could be, I didn't think I was going to do that that day, but then everybody went in. So I went in and I was also dumb and I forgot to take this off. Like this place will be full of cameras. But then, I, I, there is an element of that. I think yeah. people didn't didn't they didn't, didn't think know. they were going to be they storming were. the building. No, uh, very exciting that we and are. And we're uh, caught up in the crowd of the oath keepers and the insurgents who were definitely there to storm the building, and they were definitely there to put the fear of God into Mike Pence, if not yes. actually execute him. Yep, yep. And then uh, I don't know. And Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Yes. The whole line of succession. Their hands on. Uh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> that was a bad decision on their part. Uh, and uh, all right, what else? We've got the, the COVID yeah, we're bill. We're hearing move. about that today on, uh, in the Senate. Okay. So, oh, lots well, of stuff good. to choose from. The, the Becerra hearing is also happening today. Uh-huh. Um, apparently, Susan Collins says she's astonished that Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID package doesn't include provider relief. For Uh, long-term care, which, you know, had Susan Collins not been posturing in saying she was going to, she she was demanding unity from Biden on the bill um, Mm -hmm. and actually, you know, working on it, offering things up, it might be in there. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, there might be an opportunity to slip that in there and she's just doing that and then... I'm astonished, and then it'll be put in because it's probably not a bad idea. And, you know, we might also get her vote if we put it in there. Uh, and then she'll say, look how effective I am in Washington. 
It's a good trick if it works that yeah, way. Of it's course, a trick. If it works uh, the other way or she gets course, it in and then Susan votes Collins no. Susan Collins is the person who offered a, a relief bill that was a third of what. Yeah. Uh, and and wanted hmm. Biden to take her seriously. Yeah, coming up to the to the Oval Office with six hundred billion and saying this is our right. limit. Yeah, uh, I don't know how it'll work out, but it might be interesting to see whether there was long term care provider relief in that bill. There's not a lot, not as much room for giving out money in a bill that's one third the size. Uh, maybe it had it. Maybe it, maybe it didn't. I would like to know. Uh, that would make an interesting research project, but uh, okay. Actually, yeah. I did not spend a lot of time looking at what was I, in the six hundred no, billion either. dollar Republican bill because it was pretty much ridiculous. I mean, yeah, there was no, definitely the a time, lot more PPP funding because, as she will not let us forget, she and Marco Rubio came up with the PPP program. Mm-hmm. Oh, so they're they're responsible for that nickname. And... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Donald Trump came up with the first PPP program, but uh... <laughs> which, by the way, the Biden administration is opening up broadly tomorrow to far more small businesses who will need it. Starting tomorrow for two weeks, it one. will be closed to any applications except for very small employers with fewer than twenty employees. Ah, okay. So that finally these guys get a chance at some of that money. There is some That's left good. over. Yeah, I actually I got a uh, I think an email, you know, solicitation of some kind in there, and I, I they, they were under the impression that I like I would like for the podcast, you know, <laughs> apply for some. Like ah, uh, I have a feeling that would be like that, that feels fraudulent. Although everybody else seems to be stealing this money left and right. <laughs> But I don't I'm like I want to do that. But I thought, oh, well, I, I know I'll steal it and I'll give it to Scott, who, you know, <laughs> is writing all the summaries and deserves lots of money. But I hate to give him a bunch of money and then have it turn out to be, ah, uh, yeah, you got to you actually have to pay that back. Oh, <laughs> I'm the one guy uh, at figures. You're such a Democrat. Uh, yeah, that's why I don't get anywhere. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, well. I'm not you running for Senate in Georgia. Opportunity to potentially defraud the government, yeah. and you say no. I can't. Do I can't that. do that. That would be awful. <laughs> Imagine the guilt. But yes. Yeah, so all right. Well, I'm not doing it. And uh, whatever. Okay. That's so. But that'll open up. That'll be great. Yeah. A lot of uh, very small businesses felt shut out by it, and especially initially. And a lot of a lot very of small businesses were shut out. It was yeah. large businesses that already had strong relationships with banks who, when there was just even the whisper of this happening, went to their banks and said, okay, get ready. We're going to apply for this. Mm, yeah. Uh, leaving many, many behind. But the $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill actually does include some help for a lot of the businesses that were left out. Good. Um, targeting in particular restaurants and bars and those kinds of particularly hard hit hmm. businesses who yes. just I've been saying for a long time for whom the PPP did not work. Okay. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's a little late for, you know, keeping them closed, which would have been helpful with the whole pandemic, but still, if they're still around, uh, everybody still needs help. So it's good news. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, had had 11 months ago, 10 months ago, we had said, okay, what we have to do is what European countries are doing, and that's provide paycheck subsidies Yeah. so that you can stay closed and not spread this and we can control the virus. That would have been really smart. Yeah. So we know why but, that didn't happen. Yeah. So yeah. Now that we're in Instead, charge, I guess we created we're this ridiculous loan program. That we had to keep changing the rules on because it kept not working for people. <laughs> and it was never ended up actually being a loan. But okay, at least that was the good part of the program. Those yeah. People were going to have to pay it back. Well, okay. So uh, not a bad day shaping up. Lots of uh, hearings and progress being made. And as you mentioned, the uh, House will likely finish its business on the big COVID relief bill via reconciliation by the end of the week or early weekend. Which means yes. it's on tap in the Senate. And we'll next move week. on, and next week we can talk about it in the Senate. Excellent. Okay. And what we don't have crazy. to talk about mm-hmm. is anything Donald Trump is tweeting. So there's that. True. Right. Uh, he's gone from Twitter and uh, stuck putting things out by Telex. 
and, That's okay. and Sharpie. Yeah, right. Whatever he can write and scribble and throw out the window of Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> Ah, okay, it certainly is a, a, a better environment all around. So, yeah, I appreciate uh, your coming in and enjoying the relaxed atmosphere. Next, we'll check in on the Senate version of the Reconciliation Bill, where all the action will be happening between the parliamentarians and the budget chair, Bernie Sanders, and Democratic ranks in the Senate. Very good. Absolutely. Thanks Talk again, Joan. All right, take care. I'm looking forward to it. Time now for us to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy today. Bring up today's summary and take a quick glance around and preview what's coming up next. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. All right, let's see. Uh, Republican lawmakers say they need to kill that COVID relief bill because it helps too much. Can't have any of that. Republicans, of course, outraged the thought of aiding farmers who aren't white. And congressional Republicans are putting right-wing extremism above all else, even above big business. So that's new development, too. Next.